Hello, OFAD lads and lasses. It is Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023. Unlike most Tuesdays, we do not have a regular episode of OFAD this week because of the holiday. However, I have published an article today at onceforalldelivered.com. It is available there for you to read, and I will also now provide an audio reading of this article. So if you'd prefer to listen instead of read, it is available for you on our podcast feed. The title of the article is, Reform Seminaries Took Millions in Federal COVID-19 Aid, with the subtitle, can leaders say no to Caesar's unrighteous demands when they say yes when he had his checkbook open? Again, this is by me, Andrew Smith. Prior to my enrollment in seminary in 2018, I worked for a state government. One of my functions there was to apply for federal grants for construction projects within the state. We were a rather successful operation. In my final year there, our team landed tens of millions of dollars for infrastructure improvements, and I got to know the federal grants process quite well. During my first full year of full-time seminary in residence, Carl Truman came to campus and gave a lecture titled Follow the Money. As the name indicates, the lecture was a brutal but honest takedown of why seminaries do the things that they do. It is often not pure conviction, but financial and economic incentives that lead seminaries to add superfluous programs, major in and heavily market niche theological distinctives, and in general creep from their mission of training ministers for faithful gospel ministry in Christ's church. After all, at their core, seminaries are businesses that have to keep the doors open and the lights on. I bring up these two stories from two worlds I inhabited because they collided in 2020. When COVID closed down much of the world, including seminaries, the government was here to help. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act, and subsequent legislation allocated trillions of dollars to aid businesses and other organizations affected by the pandemic. The most well-known and well-used of these programs was the Paycheck Protection Plan, or PPP. Another program, particularly aimed at institutions of higher learning, was the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, or HERF. Religious institutions were allowed to participate in these programs, and many churches, educational institutions, and other religious nonprofits did, including parachurch ministries like Ligonier Ministries, which took PPP loans between $2 million and $5 million, and the Gospel Coalition, which took PPP loans between $350,000 and $1 million. Because these are government programs, most of the data concerning their use is public record. As a recent seminary graduate from an institution that used these funds, I decided to dive deeper and see what seminaries were using these funds and to what extent. The Programs and Who Used Them The most popular program of COVID relief funding was the PPP. This was a program of government-backed forgivable loans that could be obtained through many banks to help organizations meet payroll obligations. The terms were rather straightforward. First, borrowers were required to maintain employee and compensation levels during the loan period. Second, loan proceeds were to be used on payroll and other eligible expenses, of which a minimum of 60% had to be payroll costs. The second program of interest to this analysis was HERF, which was a program of federal grants specifically for higher education institutions. As a grant program, it was subject to the same federal grants process that I used in my former employment. One additional requirement of HERF was that a portion of grant funds had to be direct distributed directly to students to cover pandemic-related educational costs. Several NAPARC adjacent seminaries used PPP and HERE funding. Below are the data for individual schools. For PPP, 
Only loans in excess of $150,000 are reported in the public data. And reported amounts are not precisely reported, but rather given in ranges. Here, funding is documented to the exact dollar amount. All schools together took between $3.6 million and $9.9 million from these two funding programs. First, Covenant Theological Seminary. This is the denominational seminary of the Presbyterian Church in America, located in St. Louis, Missouri. Covenant received PPP loans between $1 million and $2 million and received HIRF grants totaling $498,752. Next, Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, which is an independent seminary that primarily focuses on the PCA and the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the OPC. Greenville received PPP loans between $150,000 and $350,000. This one surprised me given GPTS's unaccredited status, which would seem to indicate an ambivalence toward federal government involvement. Next, Knox Theological Seminary, an independent seminary located on the campus of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, a PCA congregation, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Knox received PPP loans between $150,000 and $350,000. Next, Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary. The denominational seminary of the Heritage and Free Reform Churches, located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It also supplies ministers to several other denominations. Puritan received PPP loans between $350,000 and $1 million. Next, Reformed Theological Seminary. The largest school in this analysis, consisting of multiple campuses all over the country and likely having supplied ministers to every NAPARC denomination. RTS received PPP loans between $1 million and $2 million. Next, Westminster Seminary, California. Founded as an offshoot of Westminster in Philadelphia, which is below, but now independent with a focus on the PCA, OPC, and United Reformed Churches in North America, URCNA. This is the one whose piece of paper hangs on my wall. Westminster, California received PPP loans between $350,000 and $1 million, and HIRF grants totaling $182,320. Next, Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. This is the storied school founded by J. Gressa Machen, who also founded the OPC, though its graduates can be found in many other denominations as well. Westminster, Philadelphia received PPP loans between $1 million and $2 million, and HIRF grants totaling $567,872. Missing Pieces Some seminaries are a part of colleges that received both PPP and HIRF funding, though it is not possible from the existing data to separate seminary funding from college funding. This applies to Erskine College and Seminary, the denominational school of the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church, and Calvin University and its seminary, the denominational school of the Christian Reformed Church, a non-NAPARC denomination but still notable as many current NAPARC pastors attended there. While Christian universities receiving such funding is worthy of its own discussion, it is outside of the scope of this analysis. The exception. While this list is not exhaustive, one school that was notably absent from both the PPP and HIRF databases was Mid-America Reform Seminary. While it is possible they borrowed PPP under the $150,000 reporting threshold, I cannot find any record of their participation in either program. Concerns. By this point, my listeners might be asking why I am so concerned with these institutions participating in these funding programs. After all, everyone was affected by the pandemic. 
the money was legally offered and obtained, and the amounts here are just a drop in the bucket of federal spending on COVID aid. Some might even argue that it is better for this money to go to seminaries and other religious institutions than their secular counterparts, or that such institutions taking this money is at least value neutral. So what is the problem? One thing I learned during my own government work is that there is no such thing as free government money. While we can talk about elections and constitutional ideals and such, the cynical truth is that perhaps the greatest way the government, and particularly the administrative state, exercises leverage over institutions and individuals is through its power of the purse. That is, controlling who receives government funding and the terms under which that funding is given. Put simply, government money always comes with governmental control. While most of the seminaries that I have analyzed here are not affiliated with particular denominations, at their heart, all seminaries exist, or should exist, to be servants of the church, tasked with preparing qualified men to know and preach and teach the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Furthermore, given our culture that prizes education and credentials, Many churches, pastors, and congregants look to their preferred seminaries for leadership and guidance when dealing with difficult issues. Once Caesar's money gets involved, things can get messy. I know that at least some of the schools listed in this article also participate in federal student loan programs, which carry similar risks, never mind the ethics of student loans in themselves. What happens when Caesar decides he does not like what the faith once for all delivered has to say about things like women in church office, abortion, LGBT issues, and other matters of biblical teachings that become political hot buttons? Does a school maintain proper moral authority and objectivity to say no to Caesar in these cases when it already said yes when Caesar had his checkbook out? Furthermore, are schools developing an unwise dependency on government funding that will not be easily severed if such encroachments from the government come? Even COVID aid programs show at least the potential for such encroachments. As funding programs go, the strings attached to PPP were relatively benign. Essentially, the only major catch was that the funds had to be used for payroll and related expenses. However, while there might not be any particularly troubling strings with PPP, questions regarding the general wisdom of taking government funds remain. With HIRF, which was taken by Covenant and the two Westminsters, things get more complicated. As a grant program, applicants are required to complete the federal SF-424, the standard form for applying for and receiving federal grants. Every SF-424 requires the applicant to provide a signed set of assurances. Of particular concern in the seminary context is assurance number six. There the applicant certifies that they will comply with all federal statutes relating to non-discrimination. These include, but are not limited to, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin, Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 as amended, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 as amended, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of handicaps, the Age Discrimination Act of 1975, as amended, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of age. The Drug Abuse Office and Treatment Act of 1972, as amended, relating to the non-discrimination on the basis of drug abuse. The Comprehensive Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism Prevention, Treatment, and Rehabilitation Act of 1970, as amended, relating to non-discrimination on the basis of alcohol abuse or alcoholism, Section 523 and 527 of the Public Health Service Act of 1912, as amended, relating to confidentiality 
of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Patient Records, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, as amended relating to non-discrimination in the sale, rental, or financing of housing, any other non-discrimination provisions in the specific statutes under which application for federal assistance is being made, and the requirements of any other non-discrimination statutes which may apply to the application. They're quoting from the assurances which go with SF-424. I am not an attorney and do not have comprehensive knowledge of the statutes listed here. Furthermore, I have no interest in seeing race, national origin, or color discrimination at seminaries. However, a red flag goes up when seeing the language concerning sex discrimination. As Nay Park churches reserve the ministry for qualified men, one wonders if the federal government could try to leverage Title IX to require admission of female students to ordination track programs. Furthermore, Nay Park churches are unified in their stance against homosexuality and other sins and lifestyles on the LGBT spectrum. Title IX and other federal sex discrimination protections have recently become a battleground in the LGBT revolution. The Obama administration, years before COVID, issued a now infamous Dear Colleague letter attempting to apply Title IX protections to transgender individuals seeking to use bathrooms corresponding to their chosen gender identity. Furthermore, mere weeks after here funding was appropriated, the Supreme Court ruled in Bostock v. Clayton County that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits firing employees based on sexual orientation or gender identity. While Title VII is not specifically mentioned in the assurances, the broad language of subpoint J invoking any other non-discrimination statute applying to the application would seem to at least open up possible applicability. The prevailing winds of statutory and case law seem to favor any federal law prohibiting sex discrimination also being leveraged to protect LGBT identities and lifestyles. What happens when a seminary professor comes out as homosexual or transgender? What about when a person identifying as LGBT applies for, ad applies for admission, or an existing student embraces such an identity? By applying for HIRF and signing the required assurances, a seminary would seem to have painted itself into a proverbial corner should such a case arise. Conclusion in summary, I fear that seminaries may not have properly assessed the risks associated with taking federal aid at the time of the COVID pandemic. Taking any federal funding has risks involved and strings attached. Given the increasing hostility of the federal government and society generally towards individuals and institutions that hold to biblical Christian and moral standards, we must be very careful to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 10:16 here I quote the New King James ostensibly conservative and confessional schools placing themselves further under Caesar's yoke does not seem to suit that end we have a nation that in many ways looks like Sodom and perhaps we should respond to its offers of money like Abram did when offered some of the king of Sodom's plunder quoting i have raised my hand to the lord god most high the possessor of heaven and earth that i will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap and that i will not take anything that is yours lest you should say i have made abram rich that is genesis 14:22b through 24a further questions fall upon churches and congregants should we be trusting of institutions that have agreed to the terms of programs like this? Would signing the grant assurances on behalf of a seminary be an act of compromise? Do we need to more carefully monitor the health and governance of such institutions to make sure that they are properly positioned to continue to provide faithful ministers to our churches? Do seminaries feel compelled to seek funding sources like this because individuals and churches may not be doing enough to support them, especially during times of hardship? Who gets the glory when it is the government and not God's people sweeping in to rescue our seminaries in a downturn? Are we taking the king of Sodom's wealth 
so that he might say he made us rich. Did being on Caesar's payroll for a season hinder any of these institutions' leaders from speaking with courage, conviction, and clarity when Christian worship and liberty were threatened by other government measures during the pandemic? And could it continue to hinder in similar situations in the future? Who are we listening to in times of trouble, and who are they listening to? These are difficult questions, and I will not pretend that there are easy answers. But it is far better to ask these questions now than when Caesar's bill comes due. Again, this article is Reform Seminaries Took Millions in Federal COVID-19 Aid by me, Andrew Smith. It appeared on onceforalldelivered.com on Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023. If you have any questions or comments, you can visit our site. You can look us up on social media at OFAD Podcast, or you can email OFADpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.